If you have a scary story you'd like to send my way, go to AsTheRavenDreams.com and click the button to do so. And of course, thank you. I have a story that isn't creepy by my standards, and I'm a 14-year-old boy who finds most stuff creepy, but is definitely mind-boggling. Last year, on October, Friday the 13th, my school had this event afterwards that we do a few times during the year, which they call Fun Nights. Although this night was not going to be fun afterwards, I was having a few of my friends over for a sleepover afterwards, and we were ready to get all sugared up and stay up super late. But when we got back to my house, the usual route we took was barricaded off. I could see some flashing blue and red lights at the corner of my block. We were a block away from my house, so I could see the corner. But at the time, I didn't think much of it because we get so much activity here that I was kind of used to it by now. I had one friend who hadn't gone to the fun night, so he had his dad drive him to my house. I called him because he had texted me that he was there. We weren't quite there yet, because we had to go around the block to get to my street. When my friend picked up, I had asked him what was going on and said it looked like something happened with a bus or something. When we pulled up to my house, we all got out of the car and looked at the corner. When we talked to some of my neighbors, it sounded like someone got ran over by a bus. We kept watching, until I realized that they were cleaning blood up off of the street. My neighbor down the street texted me asking if I was okay, because she had seen the person was roughly my size and was riding a scooter that looked a little bit like mine. I had told her that I was fine, and that I would talk to her later. When I told my friends about what she had told me, my friend, let's just call him H, looked like he was about to puke. When me and my friends asked him what was wrong, he just looked up and said, my brother rides his scooter all over town. I had met his brother a few times, and I thought he was a really cool guy. And yes, I could confirm that he rode his scooter all over. His brother was a year older than us, but we still had fun hanging out with him. When H got a call from his dad, his fears were confirmed. It was his brother. We waited with him until his dad came to pick him up. When he finally did, he had talked to my parents quickly. When they came back in, they sat me down in the dining room and had told me that he had died on arrival. That's the first time I ever cried in front of my friends but it certainly wasn't the last. Now, I'm not a religious person, but if a friend needed me to, I would pray for them. And that's what we did. And the rest of the night, we decided not to mourn, but to celebrate his life by having the most fun that we could that night. We did all the things we were planning on doing that night, and it was amazing. Now, yes, I know what you're thinking. This isn't supernatural at all. I'm not quite done. That night, when everyone else was asleep, my friend, let's call this one C, told me that all he had wanted to do was talk to him one more time, referring to H's brother. I had told him that that would be the best, and then we went to sleep. The next morning, my friend had told me that he had talked to him. I was surprised at first, but... I've always been a strong believer in the paranormal and all that. I asked him what they talked about. He said that he didn't remember exactly what they had talked about, but that it was a nice conversation. I was a little jealous at first that he got to talk to him, but I knew that my friend was the perfect person for H's brother to talk to. Plus, I wasn't ready to say goodbye yet. That would come later. I really hope you enjoyed the story, Raven as I've been wanting to share it ever since I started listening to your podcast on Spotify about three weeks ago. And keep doing a great job. Thank you. Quick 
quick trigger warning for this story. Um, it does have mentions of self-harm and ending of one's life, so just a heads up on that if you don't want to hear it. Story's not for you. It's not detailed, it's just mentioned. I said that the haunted dorm, where Baby the kleptomaniac philodendron stole its first balloon, and the bone lab were the only human ghost encounters I've had. That was an inadvertent untruth, as recent events brought to my attention. I was seeing a new doctor. You know those new questions they ask? Like, if you're safe at home, you have enough to eat, are you experiencing depression? I highly approve of these questions, by the way, but it was that last one that nearly got me into trouble. See, I've been coping with depression since I was four years old. Half a century on, I'm pretty good at it. At this time of my life, I have achieved multiple life goals, I have a job that is both interesting and fulfilling, a loving family and friends, and a home of my own. Life is good. But even so, I practice my coping mechanisms on a daily basis. When they asked the question about depression, I told them honestly that my life has been great, and without thinking, I popped off with, I haven't tried to unalive myself since I was eight years old. And I immediately realized that statement could go wrong very quickly. Because being a good medical personnel, they asked, what stopped you? Feeling a little panicked, I told the truth. Granddaddy. They moved on to other questions. Phew. Because Granddaddy was dead. That's why I was so depressed that eight-year-old me went into the kitchen in the middle of the night, pulled the biggest knife out of the drawer, and contemplated where to apply it. No, I probably wouldn't have managed to unalive myself, but I was desperate to stop hurting. So much that I'd have made a mess of myself, not to mention the trauma to my parents, siblings, etc. But something happened. I'm not sure exactly what happened. There was sunlight beaming through the windows, and daffodils, and granddaddy, and love. In the end, I put the knife away, and I went back to bed. You can say it was a dream, but I know it wasn't. For one, I was most certainly awake. For another, well, to put it simply, my dreams during that time were nothing like that. No, life didn't magically get better. There were many weeks of nightmares and little sleep when the world trudged on, bleak and empty. But there were daffodils. They were a reminder of hope, a promise of better to come. And then one day I was sitting in the car, in the front drive, waiting to leave for yet another counseling session. My parents were wise and well ahead of their time in many ways. The neighbor on the hill behind us had a new stereo system. To try it out, they opened the doors to the porch, cranked it up, and Calypso rolled down through the orchard across the valley, broke like a wave against the opposite ridge, and flooded back. The sun shone down. The hills and valley were filled with earthbound clouds of white apple blossoms, the palest blush, and the ground below was covered in yellow mustard flowers. For the first time in months, I saw what beauty life can hold. Little by little, I learned to seek out reminders of life, of love, of hope. I find music that lifts my spirits. I cover my cubicle walls with images that remind me of myself, my accomplishments, and what I have yet to do. Yes, I give myself permission to escape into books, movies, and good company, but I also join service organizations and volunteer. I craft, write, hunt fossils, and garden. I found a home where I can look out my window and see trees. I feed deer and birds from my back porch. I even learned to scuba. a hey, Calypso. But it was Granddaddy that gave me that first yellow petal of hope.
my brother passed away in a motorcycle accident back in 75. He was 16 and this happened 5 days before my 15th birthday, which put a huge damper on my birthday and the upcoming holidays. I will call my brother Eric as I wish to remain anonymous. I was now an only child and was very lost. Everyone took care of mom and dad and I was just left out in the cold. I found that I couldn't relate to my peers, or anyone for that matter. I wrestled with depression and left home right after high school because I couldn't handle the memories and home life was less than desirable. After a major breakdown, 15 years after my brother's death, I was able to connect with one of my brother's friends. I'll call him Mark. Mark and I were talking via phone call and were sharing some memories of Eric. It felt good to share long pent up memories and even laugh at some of the funny things he did. A few days later, Mark called me with a bit of concern, perhaps bewilderment in his voice. To fill in a bit of the backstory, this happened in the mid 90s, while we still had landlines and answering machines. Mark's answering machine had been giving him and his wife problems. His wife had contacting the company that made the answering machine for a part to hopefully fix the machine. They had just received the part, and along with the part, the company had sent a brochure with the picture of the answering machine. In the picture, there was my brother's full name on the identification area of the picture of the answering machine. Usually it would have read something like John Doe, or something to the likes, but instead, it read Eric's first and last name. Mind you, Eric's full name was unusual, not a common name. It freaked Mark out, but I just kind of chuckled and said that he was just letting us know that he was there amongst us while we were talking about him a few days earlier. I know it may sound weird, but it was kind of comforting to know that Eric wasn't too far away. Hi Raven, I'm a new time listener to your podcast as I've just figured out how to do this techie podcast stuff on my phone and now listen as I do work as a painter and decorator. I have my own business and it helps to make the day go by. I thought you may like to read one of my experiences. These events happened to me when I was aged 20, way back in the early 80s. I still think about the experience all these years later, and the memory is still as fresh with me today as it was 40 odd years ago. And having bungee jumped and white water rafted and other crazy stuff in my lifetime, I still consider this to be the most terrifying experience of my life. I'm originally from a city in the north of England called Newcastle upon Tyne, but this happened to me to start off with in Scotland, in a place called Ayr. I was working in a very British traditional holiday camp chain called Butlins, that were very popular here with families after World War II through the 50s, 60s, and 70s before the expansion of commercial flights took people away to Spain and Europe, which resulted in the slow decline of these holiday camps. However, they were still popular in the 70s and 80s and had camps spread out over the whole of the UK. People would stay in these camps for a week or so and would be fully catered for with food and entertainment for both adults and kids. I was working there as a waiter serving breakfasts and evening meals to the campers. At the camp, the workers stayed in chalets that were located at the very end of the campsite, in two-story blocks. Each chalet housed two workers. It was all very basic by today's standards, but it was a great experience, and rather on the wild side. For a very shy and naive person as I was then, it was quite a shock to be suddenly plunged into a culture of drinking in the opposite sex. Anyway, 
It was one particular night I was having a very, very vivid dream, in which I was being chased by a very malevolent entity in a completely white and featureless landscape. This entity was very tall, maybe seven to eight feet, and for some reason was wearing a voodoo mask. I was terrified of this thing, and I was desperately trying to get away from it, when suddenly I found myself standing at the end of the chalet line that I was staying in. I felt totally confused. How did I get here? It was completely real and lucid, and I would go so far as to say that I really thought I was bodily there. I looked behind me at the moonlit trees, and it seemed like the whole image was distorting, like a reflection would on a flexible mirrored surface that was being flexed outward. I thought, he's coming through, and started running down the chalet line. I can remember standing outside my door and suddenly being on the inside. I have no memory of passing through the door, nor seeing myself lying in the bed. I jumped into bed and became rather groggy, half asleep, half awake, when I sensed the entity come into the room. It then climbed on the bed and laid down on top of me, and it felt like a heavy person lying on my chest. I felt myself sink into the mattress. It lasted for maybe four or five minutes, and then I came fully awake. The next day, I was excitedly telling people of the weird dream that I had had. But, as you know, there's nothing more boring than people telling you of their weird dream they had the night before, as the description never matches the experience. A few months later, I was back in Newcastle, unemployed again, when I got an unexpected call from a friend who lived in Edinburgh, in Scotland and who was looking for a flatmate to share expenses on a flat he was moving into, and he asked if I fancied living in Edinburgh. Yeah, sure, why not? So off I went with a few belongings in a backpack, and less than a hundred pounds in my pocket, along with a train ticket to Edinburgh. Life certainly seemed a lot simpler in those days. It had been about three months since the dream, and I had pretty much forgotten about it. The flat that we shared was a one-bedroom flat with two single beds. It was nighttime, and I was asleep when I became aware of a dark shadow in the doorway of our bedroom. This was all in my mind's eye, and I was again in a half-asleep, half-awake state. I remember thinking, he found me. Minor content warning for the next part. The submitter actually mentioned that I could edit this as it is a bit R-rated, and I will try to edit it slightly to keep it uh, a little more PG, but if you don't wish to hear this, just skip ahead about 15 or so seconds. This time I was lying on my front, and this thing climbed onto my back, and I again felt myself sinking into the bed, unable to move or shout out. It then, shall we say assaulted me in a way that was extremely unpleasant. It again lasted for maybe four or five minutes, and I then came fully awake. I told my friend about it in the first dream, and tried to pass it off as a bit of a joke, but in the back of my mind, I was worried about it all. It seemed so real. The thing that bothered me the most was the fact that I was in a lot of pain that day, and actually collapsed in the street unable to stay upright, but I kept telling myself it was just a dream. However, the physical side of it was very real. Again, about three months passed, and it happened again, but this time I was fully awake and knew that this was real. I was asleep having one of those bizarre dreams we all have from time to time, the kind of dream that makes you laugh in the morning and think, where the heck did that come from? I remember the dream so vividly because I was snapped out of it so suddenly. I was lying on my back and someone grabbed my arm around my bicep. It was completely real and I opened my eyes and just thought, oh god, not again. I felt completely paralyzed and the only thing I could move were my eyes. 
I couldn't speak or move an inch. The state that I later found out is called sleep paralysis. I then felt a person climb onto the bed and on top of me. I again felt myself sink into the mattress. There was no doubt this time. I was fully awake, and the sheer terror I felt was indescribable. Nothing has ever come close to that level of fear in my life since. I shut my eyes, but I felt compelled to open them and see if I could see whatever it was that was on top of me. An act I still regard as one of the bravest things I have ever done. However, there was nothing to see, other than the ceiling. But the smell... All I can describe it as is all the worst smells you've ever experienced. Vomit, rotting flesh, excrement all rolled into one stench. I was trying to wake my friend, but was unable to call out. But I could breathe, and I started to breathe very heavily, and hoped the sound of my hyperventilating was enough to wake him up. I was desperate for someone, anyone, to just drag me off of that bed, and would have paid anything they asked them to do it. As I did this, I felt a hand go over my mouth, as if to smother my sounds. I just thought, shut up John, it'll go away soon. The experience lasted again about five minutes, and it slowly dissipated and I regained the ability to move my body. I lay there feeling tears roll silently down my cheek as I came to terms with what had just happened. As the day went on, my friend kept asking me what was wrong as my behavior seemed so off. I eventually said, okay, I'll tell you as long as you promise not to laugh. And as I told him, I broke down with emotion. Rather embarrassing for my friend, as he is a total non-believer in anything like this. And he just looked at me with a confused look on his face. Again, it was about three months later, and I had the whole experience happen again. The feeling of someone lying on top of me, the sinking into the bed, but this time was different. This time the entity started to whisper in my ear. Over and over again, it said to me, Let me in, John. Let me in. I knew at the core of my being that if I just relaxed and opened myself up, this thing would enter me and my body and mind would be lost. I just knew that it would possess me. I then had an experience which, at the time, I did not understand, but years later I saw it described perfectly in a book I was reading, as a full-blown Kundalini experience. I felt this energy at the bottom of my spine start to rise upwards through my spine, into my head, and then burst out of the top of my head with such force that it took my breath away. In my mind's eye, I saw this entity explode into a million pieces. I honestly believe we all have this energy laying dormant in us, but it can take something extraordinary to release it. I just thought in my mind, a kind of knowing that this particular entity would not come back, and try that again on me. I must admit that my life has been one of rather high degree of strangeness, something I put down to my mom's side of the family, who all seemed to be on the spiritual side, as opposed to my dad's, who all seemed to be of the belief that once you're dead, you're dead. These experiences do still happen to me to this day, but not to the extreme of the experiences I had then. My wife is under strict instructions that if she hears me in distressed state while asleep, she is to wake me up immediately. She has seen these dark entities during nighttime, once standing next to the bed, and once a dark shadow lying on my chest, and hearing it scuttle around the duvet. But that's another story. I may send some of my other stories one day, which range from more paranormal stuff to glitches in the Matrix. Thanks for listening, Raven. Keep the stories coming, as I have a lot of walls to paint. Hi, Raven. Long-time listener, first-time submitter. 
I'm a 50-year-old male, and my parents died when I was 26. We had a very loving upbringing and a very close relationship with our parents, my four siblings and I, and I was particularly close to my dad. He was the best dad ever, and I could always talk to him about anything. I had many occasions where I would drop by just to visit and talk with my dad. We were extremely close. Well, about ten years after he passed, I was very depressed with a wife at the time, and really needed him in that moment. It was a cold night, and I decided to make a fire outside at my fire pit. I had some depressing country music playing low in the background, and as I sat by the fire, I was saying a few prayers and talking to my dad in heaven while staring at the fire. A little backstory. I inherited the house my parents once lived in, and was living in it at the time. From where I sat, I could see the window of the house near to where my dad used to sit in his recliner, and although it was dark outside and all the lights were off in the house, I caught a glimpse of a curtain being slid over the window, exposing a lamp that was on in the house. Now, I didn't have curtains at the time, I had blinds and I didn't even have a lamp and set up like when my dad was alive. So, I immediately knew that something was up. I jumped up and ran inside the house thinking someone was in my house. Well, when I got inside the house, of course, no one was there. It was just as I had left it. Then, it hit me. My dad always used to pull the curtain over to look outside, when he was in his chair. I knew right then that my dad was comforting me in my time of need. Although he was long gone, he still came to me from beyond to tell me everything was going to be okay. Once I established that, I immediately felt better about my situation. It was definitely a life-altering moment for me. Thanks for letting me tell my story, and keep up the good work, Raven. I love your channel. here's another one of my funeral home stories. Most of my encounters in my 30-year stint subcontracted at a funeral home were mostly mundane paranormal activities, such as voices, music playing for no reason, and an occasional light flickering. But only a few were worth sharing, so here goes. I was subcontracted to do hair and manicure on deceased women, but occasionally helped dress and help get them into the casket. I usually worked alone with the funeral director passing through to either say hello, or give me pictures of the women so that I could arrange it accordingly. This day I was alone, and busy working on a frail elderly woman. I'm usually engrossed in my work, but out of the corner of my eye, there stood a tall man in a dark suit, just standing in the doorway. I thought that it was the funeral director, so I turned my head to say hello, but no one was there. I shrugged it off and continued working, but the figure kept returning, just watching, but would disappear if I turned my head to see who it was. I was almost done with her hair when the funeral director did walk in, but now the figure that kept mysteriously coming in and out came in with the director and stayed just watching lovingly. I finished my job and the funeral director then placed the woman in the casket and arranged her for viewing. The funeral director then pushed the casket out of the prep room to the elevator. The handsome figure followed and disappeared into the elevator with the elderly woman and the funeral director. I did mention this encounter to the funeral director, but neither one of us figured out who this was that was accompanying this woman as she never married. Perhaps it was just a relative, or an angel. So that, my friends, was a collection of paranormal stories, all of these submitted directly to me from my website, by listeners like you lovely folks. All they did was went to asthereavendreams.com, 
click the button that's designed to be in the center of the screen that says submit your story, typed the story up, and sent it my way. Of course, you can also email me stories. Uh, I don't see them as frequently as I do these ones because these ones come directly to me. Sometimes email ones get locked, get locked? No, get lost in the mix, but either way, I typically see them. And of course, if you do send me a story and you don't hear it after a while, you're always free to send me an email as theravendreams.com, nope, sorry, as theravendreams at outlook.com or at gmail.com and ask me if I've gotten it and I'll typically respond within a day or two. Yeah. Uh, all stories are welcome, of course. But anyways, these paranormal stories, some fantastic paranormal stories with some, some of them feeling actually kind of uplifting, which is nice. These were nice stories. I quite enjoyed them, so hopefully you enjoyed them. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button. If you're new to the channel and liked what you heard, consider hitting that subscribe button as that helps tremendously. And if you're feeling ever so bold, go down below the video and leave me a comment letting me know your thoughts, how you're doing, what you had for lunch, whatever you want to leave. You can also join Patreon memberships for get early access to content like this, as that uh, also supports the channel further. Or do a super thanks, which is a tip to the channel, which is never expected but always appreciated. And lastly, I want to let you all know that get to this point, there will be a second paranormal video this week. Tomorrow, actually. It's going to be a remade paranormal video, but it will be a second paranormal video. So hopefully those of you that said you wanted more paranormal stories will enjoy it. Well, that's it, friends. Hope you're having a beautiful day and a beautiful week so far. Hope I do see you again here very soon. But until then, remember you are loved, you are valid, you are important. You are the best you that you can be. Do not forget it. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Until next time, much love and sleep well.